Welcome, welcome, welcome to the very first time we're doing this new feature called the Lore Week. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard me talk about this before, this is an idea that was pushed forth by Johnny, uh, one of my viewers on the stream, who said, hey, you know what, it'd be cool as if you did a weekly thing where you uh, made sure you were actually ready to start when you hit play rather than actually to close your door. It was a neat idea, being ready to go, but I decided, no, nah, I think I'll go with something else instead. Uh, this is the Lore Week, uh, where we're going to be talking about different kinds of events that happen during the week, and just kind of discussing them with you guys. I, this is intended to be a regular feature, most likely going to be happening every Sunday at about this time. We're starting a little bit early, uh, because, frankly, my internet's been out for about 20 hours, and that actually set me back, believe it or not. And there's a lot of stuff I need to get uploaded before E3 starts later today. Let me go ahead and say this real quick. Um, I would rather uh, it, that we don't really have a lot of E3 discussion now, mainly because E3 hasn't actually happened yet, and I would like to have some stuff to talk about next week, uh, because next Sunday will, of course, be another lore week, and I'm sure we'll be talking about nothing but E3 news during that time. I have a few bullet points here. I actually have a piece of paper. It's a little notepad I keep right here, just to keep notes of things that have happened throughout the week, things I wanted to talk about, things I wanted to discuss, you know, that, that kind of a thing. So there's plenty of, uh, there's actually been a surprisingly large number of topics by complete coincidence. The first week I decided to go ahead and discuss uh, this kind of a news thing. All of a sudden there's news to discuss. It's amusing. So let's just, uh, I, before I, I go forward. Uh, hi, Myron. Um, before we go forward, uh, do you guys want to start with the best or the worst? Just, just curious, because I've got a couple of things that look interesting, and you know I have some stuff to talk about, and then we have something to talk about which is absolutely terrible. <laughs> Your guys' choice. I'll, I'll let you choose. I'll let you choose. While we get to that, why don't we discuss something I don't have a lot to talk about? Pacific Rim Two. Um, so Pacific Rim Two. Is, so let me, let me just rewind a bit. For those of you who are not aware, Pacific Rim 1 is a surprisingly good movie. I say surprising because it's a really dumb movie, when you really think about it. It has a terrible plot. Its overall construction of the writing is just plain bad. The characters don't really grow or move anything. And it is completely cliche-ridden. Yet, I like it for basically the exact same reason that I enjoy Independence Day. The first one, you know? Because it's so utterly unashamed in its embracing of its nature of what it is. Independence Day was aliens, boom, America. And it just absolutely embraced that so wholeheartedly that the enthusiasm of it helped to sell me on something that otherwise I probably wouldn't have liked. Same thing with Pacific Rim. Giant robots, giant kaiju, go. And that was pretty much the premise of Pacific Rim. So, Pacific Rim 2, for those of you not aware, has had a lot of issues in production. A lot of issues uh, going... You know what? I, I just realized I can do a poll. A lot of issues in actually getting getting its momentum up. It has... Uh, hang on just a second. There you are. Let's get you going here. A uh, lot of issues getting going. Uh, Del Toro has been having some issues even, even getting the script moving. All of a sudden, it's suddenly coming out in November. Uh, which is which is actually rather surprising, and the gentleman who plays Finn in Force Awakens is apparently playing the lead, which, in total honesty, automatically makes me inclined to watch it because that's awesome, and I loved him in Force Awakens. Um, I don't remember the actor's name. Forgive me. I, I forgot to write it down. And uh, the thing that really weirds me out, though, is that Pacific Rim 2 t takes place a couple years after Pacific Rim, and supposedly it's going to have John Boyega. Thank you, Dark Ride. Um, uh, it's supposedly going to have more kaiju focus. Um, just a second. And we'll leave this up for a few minutes there. Er, did I do it wrong? That should be the right format. Well, whatever. Um, so the fact that they're having more kaiju focus actually makes me wonder, because for those of you who don't remember, and they're, I'm about to spoil a movie that has also not only been out for a while, but has, has isn't really plot-focused, but I am about to spoil Pacific Rim, so mute me for like the next minute or two if you don't want to have Pacific Rim spoiled, okay? This is your big warning. 
the end of Pacific Rim, they figure out how to uh, they they nuke the other the alien world and they deal with that, and that's kind of just sort of dealt with and done. And yet, this one is actually going to have more focus on kaiju. And apparently there's something about the scientists who've been experimenting with the kaiju who are on this end, and there's that whole thing about, uh, you know... This is so right. Yeah, I don't know why it's saying there's no pull. Hang on a second. Uh, there's this whole thing about how... Uh, damn, now I've really lost my train of thought. Give me a moment, give me a moment. What happens if I do this? Oh, whoops. Improper syntax. There you go. Pulls up. Sorry, guys. Um, <clears throat> Hi, Marley. So, uh, they're, they're, they're doing this whole thing about how uh, the scientists may have tankered with things they weren't meant to, and, and now even bigger guys you are being built, and basically some people who actually care about things like story when in, a, in a thing like Pacific Rim have theorized that either A, it's basically the exact same plot of Independence Day 2, a.k.a. now there's the bigger and stronger kaiju, or as before we were only dealing with the, 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 like a scout force or whatever, or B, the new kaiju are actually under the control of the evil governments of the world, uh, or government or organization or whatever. Um, actually, I kind of like the idea of the second one, the fact that like, oh, we can make our own kaiju now, Rawr! but we can make our own Jaegers now, Rawr! and the two just going at it and that being awesome. Um, it, let's be honest with ourselves, something like Pacific Rim is going to have an excuse plot anyways. How many times do you see a game, or, or excuse me, a work, a fictional work, where the point is the big awesome action, and it actually has a good plot? I mean, what is this, Devil May Cry 3? So, um, <clears throat> that's actually all I got about Pacific Rim uh, 2, unfortunately. I do want to talk about one other thing. Uh, so, I'm being risky today, and this is kind of as a test, because it's our first time doing it. I'm going to be actually showing you guys a few trailers, and, uh... As a result of showing said trailers, we may get some copyright issues, and hopefully we won't. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, if I just move this here, like this, I'm actually going to make myself a little bit smaller for the, for the duration of this. Uh, and yeah, we're going to go ahead and showcase something. And I'm curious, as ever, so part of the reason I'm doing this as a stream rather than doing this as a recording is because I kind of want to hear your guys' thoughts too. So I'm about to show you something, and then I want to sort of see what your, uh, what your thoughts are on the matter. So uh, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and start. The first trailer I got for you, not strong, not weak, just something kind of neutral. I know I downloaded it. There it is. Oh, let's turn that up a bit. first on Xbox. Yeah, shut up. So, let me go ahead and just start by saying that I am actually looking forward to that. Legitimately. Um, we don't really know particularly anything about the gameplay yet. Uh, we don't really know... Just pick one, sure you. <laughs> um, we don't really know... Uh, we, uh, like how it's actually going to function in terms of actual gameplay. And let's be honest, with the first-person shooter, that's really what matters most. The cinematic looks great, but that doesn't mean anything. I am already, however, automatically positively inclined towards it. You know why? Because right at the beginning, there's this little line that says, game engine footage, not gameplay footage. And I know that sounds like a minor detail, but the fact that they are actually freely admitting the truth, 
as opposed to trying to lie to us and say that, oh, you know, uh, we this is gameplay footage like so many people have been doing for the last several years. It's a step in the right direction. One of the first thoughts I had watching that. Second thought I have, if they actually have proper Battlefield gameplay with, say, being able to be in a... Uh, a, a Zeppelin, or flying around in World War One, you know, your classic World War One style dogfight thing, um, that would be awesome. And, and, and I would love that. And uh, I'm hopeful that, no, no progressive. In fact, we're deliberately not discussing E3. Um, and I would really enjoy uh, several other things that, that they could do with the World War One thing. It is worth noting that World War One is basically my war. Uh, and, and I know what you're looking, what do you mean? Did you start World War One? Yeah, I did, I'm sorry. But no, what I mean by this is that I am a huge history buff. A lot of my viewers know this. And as and it's one of those horrible things where war is this terrible, disgusting, abominable, horrific thing in reality. But to, to, to discuss the ramifications of it and the in, in sort of in a, in a romanticized bubble, if we will, always acknowledging how terrible wars are, but looking at it from the historical perspective of the politics and the structure and the technology and the movement and the military tactics and all that is something that I find incredibly fascinating and interesting. It's something that's been a hobby of mine since I was a kid quite literally. I actually studied wars throughout high school on my own time because I thought it was interesting. World War One has always been the war for me, the Great War, and it was called that for a frickin' reason. Um, and uh, so World War One. there's just so much to analyze there. There's so much to discuss there. There's just so much to look at. World War One is one of those things that to this day we are still learning new things about, for God's sakes. And it was also the end of my personal favorite era in terms of uh, governmental politics, the era of the Casus Belli. World War One ended the Casus Belli. You want me to start with the week? Okay, so we'll get to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to, to seeing what they do with Battlefield 1. I hope we get to see some footage over E3 over the next week. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to there where we get that. And, and I see several people in chat are both positively and negatively inclined towards it. Um... The idea of trench warfare is interesting in its own right, but I'm not sure it'll really actually uh, count when it comes to a first-person shooter, but the fact that they, we do uh, have several representations of the tanks, uh, I, I really hope that they get that across properly, especially given the fact that tanks in World War I were death traps for the people in them, not the people out of them. I would, I, I, They'll never do this, but I would actually really like it if there was a possibility of you basically getting trapped in and killed in your tank under the right circumstances, you know, if someone who knows what they're doing can counteract it. That, that kind of a thing. That would be uh, interesting. Um, that's all I've got for Battlefield One. You know, nothing much to discuss there. I don't plan for this to be a long feature every week. Uh, so you guys want me to strong start? Oh, I know, Corrales. You guys want me to start weak? Okay. <laughs> Remember, you asked for this. <clears throat> I know some of you are gonna know what this is before it finishes, but I'm gonna let the whole thing play out. Okay. Jack, you can hear me. ついに我々フォックス部隊の ザボスの抹殺。ザボスの抹殺。スネーク。やるしかないんだ。わかるな。彼女は敵だ。敵。10年も一緒にいた。ザボスが敵だと。どうしてなんだどうして世界を一つにするためよかつて世界は一つだっただが大戦の終結とともに世界は分散して小ぶら部隊もバラバラになった共に訓練し共に戦った仲間私はお前を育てたお前を愛し武器を与え知恵を授け
もう私から与えるもの何もないどちらかが死にどちらかが生きる生き残った者がボスの称号を受け継ぐお互いの宙を尽くせさあ来いボスは二人もいらないヘビは一人でいい So, I know some of you are probably looking at this like, I don't actually understand why this is a big deal. No, I have not progressed. We're not there yet. You, you guys wanted me to start weak. So, uh, <clears throat> this is a pachinko machine. I'll still just open with that. This is a pachinko machine. For those of you who don't know what pachinko is, I wanted to talk about that just very briefly. Uh, pachinko is Japanese's way to technically, excuse me, technically having gambling because gambling is actually legal in Japan uh, in the strictest sense of the word. This pachinko is a way of getting around that because what you do is you buy, uh, you buy these little spheres, right? Plastic or metal, depends. And you kind of toss them in and it randomly ends up in an area and you can, you may or may not actually be able to, uh, to get some, some of these things out and you can actually turn them in to get little prizes and, and stuff like that. Um. It's a pseudo way, like I said, it, it's, it's, it kind of exploded in Japan, partially because there's some uh, cultural backing there. There's actually a, a myth. I don't know how many people believe in this, but I've heard several people uh, talk about the idea that, you know, if you were lucky at, at Pachinko, that you'll be lucky in your real life, that kind of a thing. Um, so this is a freaking goddamn Pachinko machine. They have taken the best Metal Gear Solid game. Just going to say that. They have taken what I consider to be the best Metal Gear Solid game. They have taken the Metal Gear Solid game that has the strongest story focus of all of them. They have taken the most beloved Metal Gear Solid game and a game that people have been waiting for a remastered version or a remixed version or a proper remake of for many years at this point in time. Because, hey, guess what? Um, you know, it, we're, we're really, really... Uh, it, it's, it's a game that is very, very beloved and would sell like crazy. And then they showcase these amazing, incredible... Uh, graphics that looks like them actually doing you know modern take on the Metal Gear Solid 3 and, and they actually show several characters from it it's like oh my god this is amazing and they're doing all of that to put it into a god damned pachinko machine this is actually worse than it actually already sounds because see here's the thing I, don't, I know you guys don't actually uh I know that, Dark Ray. I know you guys don't actually uh, understand... Some people don't fully understand this, but when it comes to designing something like, oh, I don't know, a game, um, doing the graphic side of things is the single biggest time and money sink that exists. I just realized I'm covering this the chat. I'm sorry, I forgot to do that here. Sorry. Um, is, is the biggest... I, I've called it the time and money black hole because, in other words, let's let me put it to you this way. If they were going... I know this doesn't quite work this way, but just... Go with me for a second, okay? If they were going to do a proper re-rank of Metal Gear Solid 3, about 20% of the development time would be spent on making the game and revamping the game and, and doing all that stuff. The other 80% would be spent on the graphics side of things because that's just how that works, especially with modern graphics, which are actually getting to the point where it takes even more time and effort and money than it used to, even in, from a percentage perspective, even counting into, uh, even taking into account the, uh, the so-called inflation of the matter. So... They actually bothered to put the time and money into revamping Metal Gear Solid 3's graphics and that new engine to put it into a pachinko machine. And, as was pointed out in chat, they had said, we're going to have this big Metal Gear Solid announcement soon, and that was it. And, and here's like the final little point here. This is, this is great. Um, the final point is that several people have been predicting for better part of a year at this point that oh i can't wait till they have the metal gear solid uh pachinko machine the big you know the the uh, the big boss pachinko machine i can't wait right and it was always a joke you know like they'll never do that <sighs> i don't know what else to say about that I, I don't know what else to say about that. It's 
kind of like someone walking up and saying, hey, listen, I've got this big uh, present for you, and it's something you've always wanted, and it, it, you can answer it whatever you want here, whatever it is you've wanted for a while now. Like, here's something that you really, really like, and here's something you really, really want, and it's going to be amazing, and you're going to enjoy it. And then they kick you in the balls. Or if you happen to be female, they kick you in the place that I'm not going to say out loud. Um, <laughs> that's the equivalent. I'm not saying that it won't be popular in Japan, by the way. Uh, Rascor keeps saying, saying over and over and over and over that it won't be, that it'll be popular in Japan, and that's great. That that's wonderful and that's awesome. Um, I, I cannot possibly d ignore the reality of what we're staring at. You realize that because of the fact that they have such a tight grip on those franchises, and because of the way copyright law works, even in Japan. That means that it's very likely that people who aren't interested in Pachinko are not only screwed now, but probably screwed in the future. Financial momentum is a real thing. If something sells, people are probably going to invest more in that thing rather than less. So the fact that it's popular in Japan is actually a bad thing overall because it means they're going to focus more on Pachinko. And you know how I know this? Because they've already been freaking doing it. Now, let's be honest with ourselves, there is a little bit more complexity about this. If you actually look into the economic model of pachinko machines right now, you know that the, the pachinko market has actually been collapsing significantly over the past three years. And it's not at the point now where they're, they can really make the kind of money that they used to be able to. The problem is, as ever, not and, and this is the exact same problem that everyone else has uh, with regards to this kind of thing. Um, the uh, any given just because a market is actually in reality collapsing does not mean the people in charge of deciding uh, what to do means that they will just because the market's collapsing doesn't mean the, the people in charge are actually going to acknowledge that it's collapsing and react accordingly. Now let me go ahead and say that I actually disagree with Rascor 100% on this one. And I'm going to say this in as calm and as reasoned a voice as I can. Because here's the reality. If we have reached a point in our history where we are willing to take a uh, cherished and well-loved IP, an intellectual property, doesn't matter what it's from, and we are willing to gut it and, and scavenge it for the purpose of making money and no other purpose... Because money is always something that is unfortunately tied into creative works. We cannot make things that add to the substance of the universe without money. That is simply the harsh reality of life. But there's always been, well I shouldn't say always, most of the time there's a thing where it's an in-between. Where it's not just about making money, but it's also about making a great game. Final Fantasy VI was made to make money and to make a great game. Metal Gear Solid the three Snake Eater Pachinko Machine is made to make money and nothing else. If we have reached a point in our society where it is considered acceptable to do something for the sole solitary benefit of making money, then in my opinion our society is already lost. So no, I am not just upset that I don't like it. I am upset that they are doing something that I consider to be unacceptable. It doesn't matter that it's Metal Gear Solid. It could be something I hate. Um, it could be a Game of Thrones thing. Or, uh, what's another franchise that's really popular that I hate? Um, some anime, some really big anime that, uh, that's some, ki some kind of, uh, help me out, guys. Some really big anime that's still going on and has tons and tons of support amongst fans. Imagine if they were trying to gut that kind of a franchise. You know, it doesn't matter if it's relevant to me. What matters is that this is a valuable IP that is being shredded for no other reason than to make money. So there is my real thoughts. You know, taking it away, putting putting serious mode on for just a second. This is why I'm so upset about the goddamn Metal Gear Solid Pachinko machine. So, we started we started weak. You guys asked for it. Ah. Uh. Yeah, One Piece would actually be a good example of that. One Piece, which is still going. And I know this because I keep up to date on it, sort of, with my friend. Uh. <laughs> actually, Luslins, we can't speak for all of them, but the ones that we have seen interviews of absolutely despise them. <sighs> yeah.
Yeah, that was starting weak. Let's move up from that. Uh, let's talk about something minor. Okay, something not really uh, a big deal. Uh, kind of segue into our next thing. I have been so far behind on everything that I've kind of fallen behind here. Peggy, 18. Ah! Real quick, in case you're not aware, Volition are the people who made the Saints Row series. Just a little bit of context there. Ladies and gentlemen, the Zero Point Dynamo means energy for all. Limitless and free. Limitless, Limitless and free. Kind of see the Saints Row influence here. Out of my way. <laughs> Looks like you found some trouble. All right, who needs killing first? Go get him, girl. You notice she's a sky pirate, by the way. Bullets. Ah, our last chance. Your pathetic resistance is amusing. But I have better things to do. Ahoy, motherfuckers! His profession is badass sailor. You want this orb so much? Well then, you can't have it. It's Johnny Cash. Actually, Mori, let me call you back. Sorry, I'm late. Too much. The sequel just got greenlit. Miss Brimstone, your so called specialists just tore up downtown Seoul. We're paying you to raise an army of agents, not a street gang. If you are getting cold feet, then go beg someone else to save the world from Legion. Otherwise, just sign the checks and shut up. I'm gonna point something out in a second here. I'm gonna have to rewind to do it. But you'll see what I mean. A street what? gang? Hardly. So I hope you were paying attention to that. Oh. I don't know if you can tell this, but look at the name under the display calls there. That is Ultor. So, for those of you not aware, all of the red, uh, all of the Volition games actually occur in the same setting. Yes, really. 
Saints Row uh, and and Red Faction actually have a common thread going through them, that being the Ultor Company and a few other things. And uh, whether or not this is more directly... Con yeah, yeah, so you notice this right there is basically the Ultor Company logo combined with the Saints logo. So... I think that's pretty much making it as official. I mean, we've suspected this for a while, but, uh... <sighs> now, we're not sure 100% what they're doing with this. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of details about this. I'm actually hoping we'll learn more about this in E3. Unfortunately, the biggest detail, the most important one of all, is the one that I don't actually know to give you, and that is what type of game this is. My friend Pax actually thinks this is going to be a MOBA, and we both hope that's not true. It is also possible this is going to be another Overwatch clone, kind of like Battleborn was. We also hope that's not going to be true. At the same time, there's a lot of things they could do with this kind of a thing. And a Borderlands-style game, co-op RPG shoot 'em up could work really, really well if they do it properly. You'll notice as they were going through, uh, there was a lot of the Saints Row flavor in the overall presentation. Very over-the-top, very action-y, very cool for the sake of cool, but again, that sort of uh, utterly unashamed embracing of that. So, I'm already overly uh, overly inclined positively towards this. What I, what I want to know, though, is what the heck is the actual gameplay? And I've done research. This actually came out like Tuesday or something like that. I've been looking into it ever since, and to my... Oh, sorry, sorry. I keep forgetting that that overrides the chat. Um, I keep... Uh, <laughs> you got to remind me. Um, yeah, very aware of itself. That's a great way to put that, Hourglass. Um, I want to see the gameplay of this game. Volition has never sent me down. Someone earlier said that they also make Red Faction. Let me go ahead and go on the record just saying that I actually like the Red Faction series quite a lot. I haven't covered it on my show, like, at all, but I am a fan of the Red Faction series, especially uh, Gorilla, I believe, is the specific one that I really enjoyed. And... Uh, it's not the most recent one. I think it's the one just prior to that. Um, Red Faction's some good stuff in general. Saints Row is good, some good stuff in general. Uh, Free Space is a little old, but you know, hey, Tigs are. Um, so yeah, I am. I am. I want to see what they're doing with this. But let's be honest with ourselves. Volition has not really been in charge of their own decisions ever since uh, the great ship THQ sank. And so it is very possible, and indeed I would even say likely, and Free Space, sorry, and Free Space, which was awesome, by the way. I am a fan of Free Space. Um, so again, that's, that's like 100% positivity. Hey, uh, good morning, Bregman. Um I am automatically positively inclined. I'm already saying, yes, I want to look into it. I hope to God the money people actually making the decisions for Volition have not said, you know, MOBAs are big right now, or, you know, FPSs are big right now, or anything like that. We'll see. Um, I really wish I had more to discuss. Unfortunately, I don't, other than the obvious things that I pointed out to you right at the end there. <clears throat> now, I know what you're thinking. Hang on, hang on. How can Saints Row actually still be contiguous? Uh, there's nothing to talk about, unfortunately, at the moment, Toll Maniac. Uh, there's been some stuff in the works regarding rescuing the IP, but it hasn't happened yet. Okay, I'll actually talk about this. So, for those of you not aware, Homeworld was rescued from the IP dump because Homeworld is another IP that kind of went down with THQ. Um, they worked out a deal where the people who actually bought the IP en enabled the people who worked on it, who made Homeworld Desert of Karak, to work on a new Homeworld game, to actually use the Homeworld uh, label, right? Um, and that kind of thing can happen. However, that kind of thing can also not happen. Uh, to use another example here, there's a company out there called Rare who still owns, uh, and, and through them someone else still owns the rights to uh, several aspects of the original Donkey Kong Country. So the more recent Donkey Kong Countries, although I absolutely love those games, are literally missing certain aspects and certain concepts from the old uh, Donkey Kong Country games because those concepts and assets are owned by the other company. So it doesn't always work out. Uh, right now... Uh, the Nordic Games bought out the IP for, um, yeah, no kidding, Dakota, uh, bought out the IP for Darksiders, and they were working, the last I checked, and this is a bit, middle about a month ago, the last I checked is they're working out a deal, uh, with the actual developers 
in order to try and push out a Darksiders 3. They are interested in doing that, but there was some kind of issue in the way, and I don't have details, forgive me. All I know is that they were having some kind of legal issue with regards to the rights, some kind of copy wrong issue, if you will. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, that's all I know currently about uh, about the Darksiders series. No, no real news, which is why I didn't really bring it up. Um... So let's go ahead and let's see what have we got else. I've looked at that, I've looked at that. Let's go ahead and talk about something else here uh, that I am admittedly a little bit excited about. Just just a tiny bit uh, excited about. In, in a sort of a vague kind of way. You know, it's, it's not really a huge thing. <clears throat> and you probably can already guess what it is. So let's talk about what they're actually doing with this while this is going on. This is Final Fantasy XII, the Zodiac Edition. Notice this is gameplay footage right here. This is in-game, in these events that are happening. Right there, you can see. So as you can see, they're touching up the graphics considerably. I haven't yet to see a good close-up of Vaughn's drawn on apps. I'm not sure if they're still drawn up. For those of you not aware, damn it, come on, show it. They're not going to. Ah, well. So let's talk about the details we do know about this real quick. First of all, obviously the graphics are touched up. Who cares, right? I personally think FF12 still stands up to this day. The only problem is the PS2. I actually played the international version for you guys for FF12 Maniac, actually. Um, and... Uh, you know, it, it it the graphics look just fine when properly emulated like that. So I mean, shrug, right? The uh, the things I want to talk about though. So the things we know that they have, uh, I don't I don't remember anymore. Tai two. The things that we uh, that we know about the the Zodiac version. First of all, it is the international version, so it's got all the changes from the international version, both the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, the biggest and most powerful and obvious change is the introduction of the class system. You pick a class, you're locked in, you actually move through a class rather than just having the entire grid open to me. Uh, I do think that's overall a positive thing. Uh, the only reason I had any issues with that at all when I was doing my playthrough is because I let you guys pick my classes and you guys hampered the hell out of me. Um, it is... Uh, <laughs> they are redoing the music... Uh, all the way through, there will be an option to listen to the original music or the new music. This is pretty similar to what they did with FF10. And uh, they're adding a few other features, like they're increasing the load times. Now, if you don't understand why that's significant, um, increasing the load times requires actually redoing some of the engine. To give you a ex direct example of what I'm talking about, when FF9 came out on the PC, they didn't actually increase load times. They added a feature to speed up the entire game. Because... The way that works is the load time delay exists there basically as a part of, uh, as a part of, or decreasing load time, whatever. As part, the, the, that, that load time thing in, exists as a part of the engine. It's a built-in mechanic that's done uh, for various reasons I'm not going to discuss right now. I just realize I'm boring you guys with code talks. So let's just move on. The point being, when they did that, they didn't actually go back and change 
the actual engine of FF9, they just made a workaround, which is the speed update. The fact that they are actually reducing load times in FF12, and b because of some things I've read about this, indicates they actually went back and redid several aspects of the engine under the hood, which is interesting because it implies, well, it doesn't imply, it states outright that they're putting more effort and energy into this than they did uh, previously. Well, what they're doing, when I say increasing load times, what I mean by that is positively impacting load times. So I'm going to stand by my statement. They're increasing load times. <laughs> um, they are they are speeding it up. There, we'll, we'll, we'll use plain speak. They're speeding it up. And uh, they are, and that I'm impressed by that, legitimately. Uh, furthermore, uh, other changes, they're adding an autosave feature. I kind of like the idea of that. But I'm not really sure what uh, I'm not sure, really sure what to think of that. And they're doing a couple of other things to retool it so that uh, the engine basically can show more with less. Uh, you kind of actually saw that in a couple of the cutscenes. None of those were pre-rendered cinematic cutscenes, other than the initial stuff, of course. Uh, but like when the the bomb was showing up in the Salika Woods or whatever, that's a good example of them actually. Um, showcasing how they can do more, especially with, and it was pointed out by chat, thank you, uh, lighting effects. They're actually redoing lighting rather than just touching up the textures and the meshes, uh, which is a nice touch. And now, FF12 Maniac points out uh, something very, very uh, relevant, the fact that they actually have access to the FF12 original code, um, so they don't have to actually rework it you know, from scratch like they would have to for previous games, like FF9, for example, uh, but they can actually do whatever. Uh, I have no news about a new game plus. I'm hopeful to get more news about uh, the Zodiac Age in the future, but basically everything I just told you is everything that I know at the moment. This is probably a, this is something that I consider to be a good thing. This is definitely a good port. I would still not call this a proper remake. I, I still would not call this in that category. Um, but to be completely honest, I'm okay with that. Even though FF12 could use a proper remake, and I think Takoida will actually agree with me on the fact that it could use a proper remake because there are certain aspects of FF12 gameplay and, and its story, most notably, that need to be redone. Para exemple, we need to fix up the last chunk of the story, the stuff that was chopped off. I talked about this during my lore run and during my rumination and during my playthrough of the international version. There's so much of the last chunk of the game that should have been there that got cut because of development reasons. So getting stuff into that would have been good. Um smoothing out certain aspects of the gameplay would be good. You know, there are things that could be that could warrant a proper remake for FF12, unlike, say, you know, some of the previous games. Like, say, FF9, I would argue, doesn't really need a proper remake, other than a few tiny little dids. But you get my point. This is, nevertheless, a good port, and I'm still in favor of good ports, especially if it actually kind of gets more people interested in the franchise and gets more people to be able to enjoy more, you know? So here's hoping we'll get some more news about what they're doing with it. Uh, my personal... Uh, about 42 minutes, bro. My personal thinking is that this is not going to be a proper remake. I don't think they're doing that. I do, however, think it is going to be a good port. And I will probably buy it when it comes out on PC. And it, let's be honest with ourselves, it probably will. Speaking of which, I do have a tiny bit of news about that. So for those of you not aware, FF10 uh, has come out on the PC, right? Now, that's obviously kind of old news, but I found out something new about it just in this last week, which I wanted to discuss briefly. And that is the fact that they have finally started working out the copyright issues. Now, for those of you not aware, one of the biggest difficulties for games coming out on the PC or for games getting re-releases is copyright issues. It's one of the reasons Earthbound took so, so long to get a second release. It's one of the reasons it took us forever to actually get a Suikoden 2, an additional version. And it's one of the reasons why FF10 didn't come out on Steam for so long, even though it was actually one of the first ones they started working on when they started their, their Steam uh, transfer. Uh, no news that I'm aware of, Hourglass. Um... So I, I bring this up because that, yeah, it's the music. It's the music side of things. You know, I've, I've said it before, license labels are the devil, um, or at least of the devil. The, uh, the music issues were a problem. They have started working through those, finally. So the fact that FF10 finally pushed through their music issues is a good thing. The fact that they finally pushed through, you know, so we can know is a good thing. There are other games out there that they're starting to finally push through these issues. I bring this up because there's one game series that still has not even had a peep of coming out on the PC, and the reason why is because of music copyright issues, and that is the Kingdom Hearts series. I am personally very enthusiastic now, now that this has finally started going the right way, that we will actually hear some kind of announcement of Kingdom Hearts being ported to the PC 
soon, and, and, and that will be awesome. Uh, no, Necro, unfortunately, that's not actually how that works. Uh, and, and it would be nice if all, uh, you know, if, if I made a game that all of that game belonged to me, but that's not how it works when a corporation makes a game like Final Fantasy. So no is the actual answer to that. Um, so fingers crossed on that. No news, but other than what I just gave you. Um, yeah, that's also true, FF12. Um, <laughs> uh, speaking of which, this is unrelated. I just want to say Dragon Quest 7 and Dragon Quest 8 on the 3DS. Yes. Th that's it. That's it. I just wanted to say that. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go to the next item on my list. What do I got? So I talked about the Volition game, which I don't know much about. The Pachinko thing, Battlefield 1, Zodiac. And so I've got, I've actually only got one more thing to talk about um, for today. Uh, one last thing. I, I kind of wanted to end on this because I'm kind of going to gush, and I'm really sorry. However, in my defense, I have received no less than 12 requests this week to talk about this. So this isn't just me. Um, you know, there's other people who actually want me to talk about this as well. Uh, and in the interest of fairness, you know, I have had other people uh, talking about this before as well. So without any further ado... <clears throat> Complete this task and return here safely, and I will name you both True Masters. <gasps> Look out! <laughs> you can leave this one to me. Hmm? <laughs> Just stop it! You treat people's hearts like bottles on a shelf, but they're not! <gasps> Are you? Be gone! <sighs> the world collapsed when the clock advanced. If only I made it in time. Not even memories. Are safe from the darkness. To spend one more night beneath the stars with my best friends. I'm doing it again. Aqua. <laughs> This world is full of light. What? Did you expect the traitor to give themselves up with that accusation of yours? That was foolish. I said, that's quite enough. Hey, maybe talking about the book will cheer you up. Not a chance. Darkness will prevail, and the light expire. Each of our copies were said to contain the events of the future. But this incident, well, it's nowhere to be found. You can barely stay on your feet! Just give up already! Why? Why did it have to come to this? Isn't it our duty as Keyblade wielders to prevent this war from taking place? Not, not possible. We need to defy the Master's teachings to protect the world! You're saying he was wrong? When the time comes, and there is war, you mustn't fight, but instead you must fly away from here to the world outside! I pause it here, because I want you to notice that thing in the middle there. Worldwide release. Freaking finally. Now, I'm going to actually move this here because I want to I want you guys to have some say in this but I for the first time I actually want to do a little bit of a piece by piece analysis of this F before I say anything let me just say hoip um <laughs> ah so 
for those of you who haven't been here for this, which is basically all of you, especially you viewers on YouTube, uh, you're not aware of this. So I, I, I may be repeating some of my stuff here. Forgive me. Because me and Samurai and a couple other people actually had already kind of dissected this trailer uh, when it came out. This is several days ago while I was working on something for... Uh, I want to say I was working on uh, something for Voyager or Babylon 5, I forget which. Um, so, the Dream Drop Distance stuff, I just want to showcase this really quick. This looks pretty sweet. In fact, I wanted to, this is actually great, I came. I went exactly where I wanted to. Because even the stuff in this section, which I have gone on record as saying that I didn't actually like uh, this section here, they have still touched up rather nicely. You can actually see the meshes themselves are a little bit more, uh, a little bit smoother, and the textures are way touched up, uh, which makes him look way better than he did back in 3D, 3D DDD. Um, the textures in general have obviously been very, very well touched up, as you as you can see. Oh, also he's still evil. Just saying it. Um, the overall uh, presentation of the animation, the, it just it's good stuff. It's exactly what you'd expect from that. This section, so I don't really have much else to say about the Dream Drop Justin section. Really, I don't. It looks exactly like the 1.5, 2.5 stuff. Woo, I'm with it. Moving on. Also, this is a good example. Several people also made the comment of the fact that you can't actually have a Dream Drop Justin's game in... Uh, in, uh, in, in, in anything other than 3DS because you'd lose functionality, to which I gotta say, obviously not. I don't know how they've worked around the two screen thing. You notice we don't actually see any interface Just and stuff. It. It's mostly cutscenes, but even the gameplay they show doesn't showcase any cutscenes or any, any UE. So I'm not sure what they're doing with that, because again, two screen format. But they did solve the problem somehow, obviously, so. Um, moving on. So here we have uh, some interesting things. First of all, I paused it here on purpose because there's something that you probably missed going live. I'm going to replay it, see if you can catch it. Be gone! Okay, it's really subtle. Like, real subtle. Skip it. Did... Be gone! Hang on. Notice the distortions around the castle. Do you see that? Now, we're pretty darn certain that this is the Cinderella... I think it's Cinderella. Yes. Castle, which happens to be in the Realm of Darkness. We saw this at the end of Birth by Sleep, so that's not exactly news. Those distortions make me kind of go... We have known for some time that things don't really work quite the same way in the Realm of Darkness. And yet, for all we know about the Realm of Darkness, we don't actually know a lot about how it actually works. I have had a theory for a long time that uh, time and, and space both are both kind of distorted in the Realm of Darkness, and that we see things that are effectively echoes of the Realm of Light. Um... We'll go ahead and sp the skip ahead a little bit. Because the there's another really good shot of it, if only right? I made it in time. There. You can really see some of the distortion effect there. And most notably, what's happened to the chunks of the world that have broken off over there on the right. You see that? Yeah. Also, we see interface for like the first time. In fact, here I'm kinda in the in the way of it. Uh Ugh, but as you can see, we've actually got you know MP bar, HP bar, the uh, the drive bar, Aqua, over there under the chat, which I'll just here. Let me just uh, do this real quick. There you can see it over there. You got command, magic items, etc. Over there on the left. So um, the Crystal Empire has returned. Um, the crystallization is something that I I significantly wonder at now. Crystals have a strong thematic significance in the Final Fantasy series, but crystals have never actually been significant in Kingdom Hearts, to my knowledge, and I imagine Samurai's going to correct me on this, but I actually thought about this. The only other time ever that I actually have seen crystals be of significance in Kingdom Hearts was with Shion, when she was crystallizing in her death, a unique death. No one else has ever died that way. Which makes sense, since she herself is kind of a unique individual. Now, you might think, well, how, how do I think that this is actually paralleled together? 
in my personal opinion, I think crystals in the Kingdom Hearts series, and I've thought this before, have to do with memory, specifically. And the way that uh, things can work like that. In other words, the idea that when memory has broken down beyond a certain point, to the point where people can't even re recall it, we get something like that over there on the right side of the screen. Not even memories are safe in the darkness. And then she says that. No, Necro. Uh, there's some good distortions here, too. You can see it here and there. It's really hard to get across the shots properly. Also, so I just want to mention one other little thing. You see in the upper right, there's something called gears. I have absolutely no idea what's up with the gears thing. I just uh, wanted to point it out. There's some kind of alternate thing there, or gathering thing there, or maybe that's part of the quest. I have no idea what that's about. Just wanted to point it out. This whole section's just gold. I have nothing to add here. This is just amazing. To spend one more night beneath the stars with my best friends. Hey, Rory. I'm doing it again. Aqua. So, there's Terra. Samurai and I have talked back and forth about what the heck is going on uh, with Terra being present here. A lot. We talked back and forth about it a lot. And uh, th we know so little here that what that is, who frickin' knows? Let me just go through some of the options we came up with. First of all, it's an illusion. Okay, that sucks. Uh, but when I say illusion, I mean literally just a, oh, it's just a, it's a memory thing. Um, well, no, I'm, I'm saying this wrong. I have a theory that it is an illusion, but not in the strictest sense of the word. Yeah, I noticed this, the, the Spellweaver reaction command thing, by the way, um, which is awesome. Uh, so, okay, okay, so it is possible Terra isn't there. Let's just start with that. It is possible that that is actually Terra. That is the real Terra, which explodes possibilities because, as I've said many times, we don't know where Terra is still. The location of Terra is one of the mysteries still remaining in the Kingdom Hearts series because after what happened to Xemnas and after what happened to everyone else who became a nobody... Uh, 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 oh my god, I can't see his name. Listen. I will... Uh, ah! <laughs> Lee is a good example of this. So, what, you know, I, I brought this up during the lore run. Where, what happened to Terra, where he was disseminated towards, what came of him, who knows, really. You know, we don't actually have an idea of where the heck Terra is. It is also worth noting that uh, this is in the realm of darkness, which, A, we've known people can manifest in despite not uh, having their bodies at the time. Riku's a good example of that. Uh, B is a place where time is distorted. We know that for a definitive. We've, we've actually already discussed that. So it's entirely possible that that is actually Terra from a different point in time, or that it's Terra because he's ended up here just like Riku did. Uh, you know, who freaking knows, really? But if that is actually Terra, the real person, that brings up a lot of theories. Personally, I have a side theory that's kind of a blend of the two. You remember how when we were going through Chain of Memories, uh, as we're going through Chain of Memories, there's a scene where we talk to Eris, who is obviously not Eris, but this Eris is, is an Eris that was... Uh, built out of the memories of Eris, right? So, in other words, she was as close to a self-aware holodeck ca character as was possible to be. And she herself knew that she was a holodeck character. You remember, I, I, I mentioned all the, the complexities of that when we were going through there. It's one of the things I wanted to talk about most when we went to, through Chain of Memories. My theory is that Terra is something like that. That this, what we're looking at is a place that, similar to uh, Castle Oblivion, is refracting her own memories back on her. But because her memories are, but because this is not just a illusion, this is a more concrete, a more complex construct. This Terra is sufficiently Terra to be considered his own entity with some of Terra's mannerisms, kind of like Eris was. That's my theory on what the heck is going on with Terra. Um, then we get to this stuff. So for those of you not aware, there's this phone game. It's called Unchained, I think. <laughs> 
which was originally a browser game called This is a Terrible Browser Game. Oh yeah, actually, sorry, I want this. So she's still got the Terra Terra's symbol uh, on her chest there. It's actually not Terra's symbol, we just associate with them a lot. It's just the general symbol of the Keyblade Masters of Light. We don't actually know uh, 100% uh, where it started from. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the Mark of Mastery itself. Um, so yeah, we've got uh, the Unchained stuff. Now, the Unchained stuff here is... It has a story. It's actually relevant to the plot. And there's a huge amount of plot relevance in this. But the problem is we don't know what its relevance is yet. We actually don't know. There is simply too much that we, ha that we are missing the pieces of. There's a lot of theories going around about it. Um, the most... Uh, the most the most immediate thing that could be mentioned is the fact that it might be happening in the past prior to the Keyblade War. It could also be mentioned that it's happening in the present or at some point more relative to the present, or it might actually be happening in the future prior to Kingdom Hearts 3. We don't actually know. And that is kind of one of the big mysteries of the Unchained thing. Now this stuff, this is back cover. This is not Unchained. This is happening during Unchained. It's it's basically uh, the... So during Unchained, we play a Keyblade wielder, one of thousands, um, who is working for one of the great uh, guys whose names I can't think of. The guys you're seeing on screen right now. I can't remember their freaking titles. Dude faces. Except there's women too. Uh, people faces. And uh, these guys have are each leader of an organization which believes that they are the ones who are using the light correctly. And uh, it is worth no noting in an amusing little sort of uh, way that uh, these guys... Hey, Zeiss! Hope you're enjoying your, your, uh, your, your vacation. Foretellers, that's them. Thank you. It is worth noting that these guys are not, ha don't have different philosophies. I point that out because most of the times when you see six people or eight people or whatever who, who are each run a different faction, that's because the factions believe in something different. That's not actually true in this case. In this case, they all believe the same thing, that they are right and everyone else is wrong, and they know how to best use the light. And they all equally think that. It's actually quite amusing. Hence, you know, the lead up to the Keyblade War. Um, so I've talked several I've talked several times about this thing. I don't want to go fully into Unchained at the moment. The stuff I want to talk about here is that as early as, I want to say, like, chapter 50-something, when Mickey first shows up in Unchained, the camera kind of pans to the side, and we see someone in a black cloak. Which is the first big mystery of the Unchained series. And uh, there has been a black cloak, one guy in a black cloak throughout Unchained, who has, who has spoken a few times, but we have absolutely no idea who that person is. And who the hell the identity of the black cloak person is has been, in my opinion, the most interesting mystery Unchained has presented and the one I have most desperately wanted to be solved. As of watching this video, I personally now have like an 80% chance likelihood, I would say. I would put a very high likelihood as to we know, we know the identity of who this person is. Um... The traitor to give themselves up with that accusation of yours? That was foolish. I said, that's quite enough. Hey, maybe talk. Ah, shoot, hang on. I went too far. Or no, I didn't go far enough. This guy right here. There he is. So, yeah. <clears throat> it's Bragg. It's frickin' Bragg. Zigbar, if you will. Everything he does, the way he talks, the way he acts, uh, the way he moves. Everything about him, every single, everything about his presentation as an individual. I pulled it up, Samurai. I fixed it. Wait, no, I didn't. Why did it? Huh? Oh, because there's a space there. Let me fix the space. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so it, 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 Samurai and I are both pretty much in agreement that this is frickin' Brig. Uh, so much of how he acts is indicative of that. That's not a hundred percent possibility, um, but <laughs> it seems really likely. Um, now, th as an aside, th some people have brought up other possibilities. I've only really heard two possibilities that have any real merit, but I wanted to mention both of them. Possibility one is that he is a uh, elder Sora. That this is happening. A lot more into the future than we already knew, and this is Sora when he's actually become, you know, a, a grown-up, you know, a twenty-year-old, basically. Um, the other possibility that has been tossed out is the fact that this is possibly Xehanort. 
of all the theories I've heard, that's the one I think that has the least weight. Yes, even more than the Sora uh, theory. In other words, this isn't young Xehanort. We've already seen and, and, and understood him. His voice actor is already set in stone and all that, and he doesn't act like this at all. No, the theory here is that this is the original Xehanort, as in that the Xehanort we see is a... Uh, what's the term? A, re, a uh, reincarnation, that's the word. A reincarnation of this gentleman right over here. Uh, like I said, I find that to be the least likely possibility. It also makes the least amount of sense. Uh, even though there are some possibilities of reincarnation within this series, even no, no, it is worth noting there has not been reincarnation in the Kingdom Hearts series yet. Uh, there has been a pseudo live stream thing with the hearts, but not actually you know a new perversion of someone. However, there is a fairly strong theory going around about how uh, reincarnation is a thing because each of the foretellers kind of lines up surprisingly one-to-one -one with one of the more modern characters, Terra, Aqua, etc. Um, but no, for me, it is extremely likely. I would, I would literally put it at about 80% chance that that's Brag or Zigmar. Why did it have to come to this? Isn't it our duty as Keyblade wielders to prevent this war from taking place? Not, not possible. That right there is a great way to uh, to explain what I mean about the whole the way that he is functioning and acting. Uh, but there's one thing, and let's see if I can get it right at the time. Why did it have to come to this? Isn't it our duty as Keyblade? There it is. So uh, as you can see, there there's something new. Uh, in the design of the coat. Obviously, Frozen has already caught it, because he's asked me about it like 30 times. Um, can anybody... Uh, yeah, I mean... You, yeah, he's got uh, something new there. And I, admittedly, I'm not 100% sure what it means, but it's worth noting that same type... Oh, sorry, sorry, chat. Yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. I can fix that. There you go. Um... As you can see, uh, it's very emblematic of the same type of emblems the foretellers themselves use. And each of the foretellers have uh, a symbol that's based on the same uh, based on the same image, just stylized in a slightly different way. So what we're seeing is something similar to that. At least that's my take on it, personally. Um, but... Other than that, I, can, I couldn't possibly tell. It's a little too indistinct, and I don't have a frame-by-frame -frame, uh, playthrough thing here to give you. Uh, actually, Final Cloud, if my earlier statement didn't get across, I've actually been playing Unchained. In fact, I am currently... If it's Axel, why does he have a completely different voice actor? And he's not skinny enough, and the code is the wrong design. Hey, Ionic Commander. Um... By the way, Organization 13 medals in Unchained, finally. I have no idea how to get them, other than spending money, which I am not doing. Screw that. <laughs> Here we go. Apparently, I am up to quest... Uh, God, why does this take seven years to load? I'm still loading. Uh, quest 74 is the one I just loaded. But the one I wanted to mention earlier, is this it? We're getting dummies. Right back here. Looks like it was quest 55 is the one where we first saw the black cloak. No chat on stream! God, make your mind up. First you want chat, then you want no chat. Um, this is another good shot of the individual. Um, so... Now, we don't know... Yeah, so, what Tob Tob points out... Yeah, let me go ahead and get chat back, because people are asking relevant questions now. Tob Tob says, hey, um, there's another foreteller. And that's true. There is another foreteller. We still don't know who it is. It's possible it, that the, the sixth foreteller is the guy in the black cloak. Uh, it's possible that, that these, theory, these theories are not mutually exclusive. So, it's entirely possible that this is not only the sixth foreteller, but also Xehanort, or also Xehanort's master, or also Brig, or also Sora, or also whoever. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any answers, <laughs> any concrete answers. I've already given my strongest theory. The other thing I want to talk about before we move on is this point right here, right here where she says you need to go to the world outside. It, it, there we go. 
Um, here, I'll just play it for you. Instead, you must fly away from here to the world outside. That night, that note right there. So, the world outside. We've known about this for a while. Anybody who's been keeping track of the game knows about this for a while. The idea of the dandelions. This is another one of those all-we-have-is-theories situations, but there's been a lot of theory crafting flying around about what, ex why exactly this place is concealed and what the world outside actually means. And... I can only shrug, really, on that one. Uh, I do have my own theory, of course, which I will share with you right now. Um, my theory is the fact that they are literally uh, inside a computer program and that she's aware of it somehow. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, that's ridiculous. You remember Recoded, where we had people in a computer program? People who generated hearts because of the fact that they had sufficient time and experience to do so? Remember that? Remember how they were aware of the fact that they were in a computer program? Remember how they basically referred to the program as another world? I'm not saying this is definitively the answer, but it is extremely possible since we've already done it. That's already a thing. So, my theory is that they are in some kind of simulation world, whether it be the, the world created by the book or the world created by some kind of program. Yeah, that's right, they did it in Kingdom Hearts 2 as well with Roxas. We know this is a thing. This is not new to Kingdom Hearts, is what I'm trying to say. So it's possible she has become aware, for whatever reason, of the world outside, the real world, and that's why she's uh, saying that. Now, there are other possibilities. Um, some people say that they might be in the realm of sleep. This would make a, a actually, a, this also has a very large amount of uh, backing for it. Somewhere back here you see for a really brief period of time. Uh, is it here? No, I guess, oh, there it is. You see that little thing right next to her over by the trees? That's called a chirithi. A chirithi is a dream thing, dream eater. In other words, a creature that cannot exist outside of the dreaming realm. Now, I actually, I already kind of explained how that works in Dream Drop Distance, and it's actually kind of convoluted, so I don't want to go back and do it again right now. The point being, what we have over there is something that should not exist in any place other than the Dreaming Realm. And there's hundreds of them, thousands of them roaming around. Every player character actually has one that follows them around. So, you know. Um, now, so what Samurai says is actually something I've considered, too. So, for those of you not aware, X and un excuse me, Chi, Ki, and Unchained Ki are actually two different things. The browser game was Ki. That was the one that uh, was in the past. Uh, or, excuse, I should, that's the one that, that came out a while ago. That's been out for a while in Japan. We never actually got an English version of that proper. Uh, Unchained Ki is a pseudo-retelling of that, but is different in several key ways, and it has been mentioned that the two are different continuities. So it is entirely likely, as Samurai says, that Ki, the original one of the browser game, was actually the retelling of the events prior to the Keyblade War, and Unchained Ki is the simulation, or the modern thing, or whatever. The dream, possibly. Um, so, you know, yeah. Um, and that and that is very, very relevant. Um, it is also worth noting that we know for a fact, and Recoded also, hey, Silver Dragon, Recoded also gave us this, the fact that there are ways to, to simulate things from both the past and the future in this kind of simulation world, thanks to this book, the Book of Prophecy, which is actually mentioned in Unchained Key, uh, and that Maleficent knew about and was actually seeking after. So, another possibility there. Long story short, we have no idea. <laughs> this could be something brand new. It could be in the Unchained Realm, whatever that actually means. It could be in the Realm of Dreaming. It could be in a, in a simulation, either a computer or of the book. Or it could actually be happening in the past. Now, I mentioned this this fifth one last because this fifth one is the most obvious answer. It's what it was actually presented as. This is before the Keyblade War. However, I find it interesting that nobody I know who has been theory crafting about this actually thinks this fifth one is true. I have never met anyone who is really deep into the theory crafting of Kingdom Hearts who thinks this is actually the events that happened prior to the Keyblade War. We, every single one of us thinks it's something else. <laughs> so, you know. Anywho, um, that's, uh, that's all the news stuff I've got. If anybody has any uh, unrelated questions regarding news in general, now's a good time for it. I'll give you a, a minute or two to talk about it. Um, 
I'm going to readjust some of my things here. Actually, I'm going to stay down here because in about four hours, we'll be covering E3. And uh, that, that is, the, you, you know, Rascor, you're absolutely correct. Rascor brings up something. The whole point of an untwist is you leave all these hints that it's something different and that it's actually the expected thing. Now, I actually like the idea of the untwist a lot, actually. Um, so it, it would, it's possible that that's where they're going with that, and that would be awesome if it's true. We'll see. Like I said, uh, the first thing we'll be covering, just for those of you aware, actually, I'll, I, I don't think I'll talk about that. Um, any other questions before I top it off? I'll just wait patiently. Battlefield 1, I talked about it earlier, Gabe Wave. Net positive. Um... <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and chop it off. So, see you next time, guys.